Hi, this is Gabe from FluentForever.com. At this point, you've seen and heard all of the vowels and consonants of Arabic. If you're using one of my trainers, it will take you through each of the sounds you've encountered here, teach you the spellings that produce those sounds, and push them into your long-term memory. And if you're not, that's okay too. The goal of these videos was to give you a passing familiarity with all of the available sounds, so that when you study them in detail, they're not going to be totally new to you. That'll make them easier to learn. In either case, since you're now familiar with all the sounds in Arabic and their IPA symbols, I want to spend some time discussing Arabic spelling rules, basically how you go from what you read to what you say out loud. For the most part, this is going to be pretty simple. Arabic is very phonetic, so once you memorize what the letters look like, you're going to be able to read most words. The purpose of this video is to fill in some of the less intuitive aspects of the spelling system, so that once you finish memorizing which letter is which, you'll be able to accurately read all words, rather than just most words. We'll divide this video up into a few parts. First, we'll deal with double consonants and the Sheddah diacritic. Then we'll talk about Arabic's glottal stop, the Hemze, and how that's spelled. We'll look at some diacritics and letters that we didn't really discuss in videos 2 and 3. And finally, we'll chat about word stress. So, let's get started with double consonants. We talked about this in video 1. If you recall, this word had an extra long B at the end. It was Dub rather than Dub. And the IPA reflects that by doubling up the consonant. Dub. The symbol that caused the consonant doubling was that little cursive W looking thing. Which is called the Shedda. The Shedda is pretty simple. As soon as it shows up on top of a consonant, you're going to pronounce that consonant extra long. So this is Sukkar rather than just Sukkar. This is Yufekir rather than Yufekir. And this is Haddad rather than Haddad. It can even show up on glottal stops, which is kind of cool. This is ra'as, meaning to make someone lead. And if you don't pronounce that glottal stop twice as long, you get ra'as, meaning to lead. Super neat. Anyway, that's how shadda works. There is one more thing to discuss here, which is how the vowel diacritics interact with shadda. Basically, where do you write the vowel diacritics, above or below it? So, let's jump back to two of our examples. Haddad and Yufakir. If we're just paying attention to the doubled consonant, you'll notice that we have an A e after our doubled D in Haddad. Now, jumping back to video 3. A e is generally indicated in Arabic with a Fatha. It's a slash that goes above a letter. And so when we're dealing with a doubled consonant, you're going to stick that Fatha over the Shadda here. So, switching vowels. If we focus on the doubled k in yufakir, we have an i sound. Again, jumping back to video 3, i is generally indicated in Arabic with a kasra. This is a slash that shows up under a letter. And so, here's the slightly tricky one. You're going to put that diacritic under the shedda rather than under the whole consonant. So, in particular, with these two vowel diacritics, fatha and kasra, pay attention to whether the vowel is above or below the shedda. And that's all you need to know about shedda in terms of pronunciation. Next up, let's talk about Arabic's glottal stop. Known as hamza. Back in video 2, we talked about this letter in words like ekalu and ra'is. And to those examples, we'll add shita, lu'lu, ukht, and iran. Now, the weird thing about hamza is that it shows up in all sorts of places, which is why we're using so many examples. It shows up at the end of words, like shita, it can show up as a standalone letter, just like any other consonant. But if it's not at the end of the word, it tends to look a lot like a diacritic. Showing up on top of the letter elif, as in ekalu, and ukht, below elif, as in iran, on top of the letter wow, as in lu, and on top of a dotless version of ya, yeah, as in ra'is. This seems honestly way too complicated. Why are there five spellings for one single letter? And the answer is naturally complicated too. It has to do with how the Arabic writing system developed out of Phoenician and Aramaic. That said, our current goal is to figure out how to read Arabic words correctly. And fortunately, Hamza is actually really simple in that respect. If you see a Hamza diacritic above or below a letter, you can pretty much ignore that letter and just read the Hamza. So, Ekelu, Ucht, and Iran, you can pretend they're written Ekelu, Ucht, and Iran. Look, look. Basically, it's lu'lu. Ra'is is basically ra'is. 
The vowel diacritics behave as they would with any normal consonant. Fatha and Dhamma show up above everything, Hamza included, and Kasra shows up under everything, Hamza included. So now we can go on to our next topic. Let's go over some Arabic letters that behave a little weirdly. First, we'll talk about Alif. Alif is the only letter in Arabic that doesn't have a sound of its own. Most of the time, it's used with a Hamza. As we just discussed. Or if it has no diacritics on it, it's generally used as an indicator for a long A vowel. As we talked about in video 3. There are, though, a few special cases with Alif that I wanted to go through now. First, there's Alif Maqsura. This one's super quick. Basically, this is a fancy, not super common form of Alif that shows up at the ends of some words. So here's Mashfa, and you'll notice at the end we have a Fa with a Fatha. So that's Fa followed by our Alif Maqsura without any markings on it. Which means we need to make that sound extra long. Mashfa. Next, we have Alif Al Mad, as in Ala. It looks like an alif with a squiggly line on top. And phonetically, it's just a glottal stop with a long a afterwards. A, a, la. And that's all for that vowel. Uh, next, we have two silent alifs. The first one is known as alif al wasl or hamzatul wasl. It's an alif with a mark that, at least to me, looks like an eagle's head on it. It shows up at the beginning of some words after certain prepositions. For example, here's fil jami'a, at the university. Uh, generally, if you want to say at in Arabic, you'll use the preposition fi. And if you want to say the university in Arabic, you'll say al jami'a. But when you combine them, you don't say fi al jami'a. Instead, you skip that first a sound in al jami'a and you just say fil jami'a. That little eagle's head basically just tells you to skip the alif. There's one last silent alif, known as alif al-fasl. And it shows up in all plural verb conjugations, where the second to last letter is a waw. For instance, in ekalu, these two letters make a lu sound. And that alif at the end isn't making any sound at all. So, we have two more alif-like things. First off, you know how you can make a long a e sound in Arabic by combining a fatha with an unmarked alif afterwards, like in taj. In literary texts, most notably the Quran, there is another way to do this, which is to use a tiny alif, known as a dagger alif, uh, just like you'd use a diacritic. So here's ar-Rahman, and that ma syllable near the end has a long a e sound, marked with that tiny alif. And so that's all you need to know about that. Our last alif-like thing is the lam alif, which is just a combination of lam followed by an alif which shows up in words like al ahya and awlad. This letter is pretty self-explanatory. It's just two letters kind of stuck together. The only thing I want to point out with this is that since it's actually two letters, it has two slots for diacritics. So in al ahya you can see that the lam part has a sukun on it, and the alif part has a hamza with a fatha. And that is it for the various forms of alif. Since we just talked about lam alif, let's jump over to lam. One of the most common words or prefixes in Arabic is al, meaning the. It's why a lot of English words with Arabic origins start with al, like algebra, albatross, alcohol, and algorithm. There's an important spelling rule that affects this prefix really often, which is what happens when the consonant that comes after that lam is made in approximately the same location in your mouth as that l sound. Basically, these are any cases where your tongue is up behind or touching your upper front teeth. And this applies to a lot of consonants. F, d, v, r, z, s, sh, l, n, and the emphatic consonants s, b, p, v. In all of these cases, rather than pronouncing two different consonants, for instance a l and then a d, you are going to simplify and skip over that lam, and then you make that next consonant extra long. So here's dub, and rather than saying l dub. The bear, you'll say, a dub. The lamb disappears and the d gets doubled. Here's ra's and sa'a. And rather than saying al ra's, al sa'a, you'll say a ra's and a sa'a. And with that, we have just a few more things to talk about. First, let's introduce you to ta marbuta. This letter has the shape of the ha letter. 
the one that makes an H sound in Arabic. Along with the two dots you'd see on the ta letter. Arabic's T. The letter shows up at the ends of feminine adjectives and nouns. The fact that the shape of this letter is a combination of a ha and a ta, that's not a coincidence. The letter can actually sound like an H or a T depending upon the diacritics above it. Most of the time you're going to see a sukun above that letter, meaning that there's no vowel that comes after it. Whenever that happens, you'll pronounce it as a light H sound at the end of a word. So here's tufaha and here's qahwa. If, on the other hand, that letter has one of the vowel diacritics above it, then you'll pronounce it as a T. Here, for instance, is sayyaratu judi. There's a dhumma over the ta marbuta, and so that syllable is tu. It's sayyaratu judi rather than sayyarahu judi. Next, we're going to talk about three special diacritics, which are pretty easy, honestly, to explain. You know how we had three basic vowel diacritics, dhamma, which made the u sound, kasra, which made an i sound, and fatha, which made an a sound? Well, Arabic has special versions of those three diacritics. They're called dhammatayn, kasratayn, and fathatayn. And they show up sometimes at the ends of words. In terms of pronunciation, they're pretty easy. You just add an N sound after the vowel. So, dhammatayn sounds like un, kasratayn sounds like in, and fathatayn sounds like an. For example, here's at-taqsu baridun, where that very last letter is a dal, a d sound, with that dhammatayn, un. So, that last syllable is dun, at-taqsu baridun. You'll see that in all three cases, they look basically the same as the diacritics they come from, except they have one extra line on them. So, kasratayn and fathatayn are each double lines below or above a letter, and dhammatayn is a dhamma with an extra little line on the left. And that is all you really need to know about those in terms of pronunciation. Later on, when you learn Arabic grammar, you'll find that those three diacritics are pretty important grammatically. They function as case markers, which roughly means that they'll help you figure out who's giving what to whom in a sentence involving, let's say, your aunt, yourself, and, say, 50 bucks. And so with that, we've reached our very last topic, word stress. Now, word stress in English is super important because it can change the meaning of words. We have pairs like incense and incense. Arabic doesn't have words that differ only by stress. And so generally, misplacing word stress isn't going to cause people not to understand you, making it less of a key topic when compared with English. That said, stress does exist in Arabic. Often it ends up being one of the ways that Arabic speakers can tell dialects apart. For instance, in Egyptian Arabic, the word for sky is sama, where in official MSA, it's sama, sama, sama. For the purposes of this video, I mostly want to just make you aware that word stress exists in Arabic, and that it's indicated in IPA using a little quotation mark looking thing here, which means that you should stress the next syllable. If, when you're learning your first few hundred words, you pay attention to the stressed syllables, you should pick up a pretty good intuitive sense of which syllables are going to be stressed in future words. And so with that, we are done with Arabic pronunciation. To quickly review what we covered in this video, we began by talking about Arabic's consonant doubler, shedda which showed up in words like haddad and yufakir. It makes consonants last twice as long, and the only real tricky thing to note is this. If you want to stick on an e vowel, a kesra, you put that kesra below the shedda rather than below the whole consonant. Next, we talked about the five different spellings for Arabic's glottal stop. In words like shita, lu'lu, ukht, and iran, and while there were lots of possible spellings, there was thankfully only one way to read them. You can basically replace all of them with a simple hemza. So for ekalu, ukht, and iran, you can pretend they're written ekalu, ukht, and iran. The vowel diacritics act as they would for any other consonant. So kesra, for instance, goes below the whole letter, hamza included. Then, we covered a few Arabic letters that behaved a little oddly. We began with alif, which usually just functions as a place to put a hamza or a long av al indicator, but also has a bunch of special cases. There was alif maqsura, which was an alternate form of alif that shows up at the ends of words. Like in mashfa. There's alif al mad, which sounds like a glottal stop with a long a afterwards. A, as in ala. Alif al wasl or hamzatul wasl a character that shows up after certain prepositions and is totally silent so here's fi and al jamia 
which when combined form fil jami'ah, alif al fasl, which was an unmarked silent alif only used for plural verb conjugations where the second to last letter is a waw, as in akalu. There was dagger alif, which was an alif used as a diacritic to indicate a long vowel. It shows up in literary texts like the Quran in words like ar-Rahman. And finally, there was lam alif, which is just a combination of those two letters, lam and then alif, in words like al-ahya and awlad. We then discussed a spelling rule that frequently affects L. Arabic's word for the. Where if a consonant after a lam is made in approximately the same spot as that lam, with your tongue near your upper front teeth, then you're going to skip the L sound and double the next consonant. So rather than saying el dub, the bear, you'll say a dub. And rather than saying el sa'ah, you'll say a sa'ah. Next came ta marbuta which was a combination of a ha and a ta, and generally sounds like an h, as in tufaha, unless one of the three vowel diacritics shows up above it, as in sayyaratu judi. Then came three fancy versions of dhamma, kasra, and fatha, known as dhammatayn, kasratayn, and fathatayn. These were all case markers that showed up at the ends of words and sounded like vowels with an n added afterwards. So, ضمتين sounds like un, كسرتين sounds like in, and فتحتين sounds like an. The example we looked at was الطقس بارد, where that last syllable was pronounced dun. Finally, we dealt with word stress, mostly just mentioning that it can differentiate dialects like Egyptian from MSA. In words like سماء and سماء. And that in IPA it's indicated with a little quotation mark. And that wraps up our series on Arabic pronunciation. If you need a hand in memorizing all this stuff and training your ears to hear it all accurately, then grab an Arabic pronunciation trainer from my website link below. You'll have all of this memorized within three or four weeks. I hope you had fun, and I'll see you next time.